Hi everybody, welcome to the webinar. Tonight I want to start off with this idea. I think it's probably the biggest barrier to, to, to families getting better, to, to parents creating a, a, a new dynamic with their child that can be productive and, and, and healthy and, and, and positive toward change. And that is this idea that parents have when they first come to our program. I don't think it necessarily applies to a lot of people that attend webinars, but it is that idea of what work do I need to do? It's not my problem. And while your problem isn't the child's problems, there is a kind of co-participation with our child in their problems. And, and our contribution to, to that dance, to that dynamic, can either be a helpful or a harmful comp contribution. And, and I want to say this. I, I want, at the outset of this webinar, to say I think it's important for parents to have a sense of satisfaction, happiness, pride in, in, in what they do, the work that they're doing. I think that's healthy, helpful, positive things but not in terms of what your child does, right? I always try to steer parents away from this idea of saying or thinking I'm proud or disappointing my child versus saying I'm, I'm proud of myself for the work that I've done. And my child's behavior, their successes, their failures are theirs. My successes and failures are mine. So with that backdrop and with that energy, I want to launch into what I think is a, a, a critical webinar, at least in terms of the principle and, and what it adds to our parent support and our parent work. From the book Journey of the Road Parent, codependency is co-participation. If we are to contribute to the health of our children, whom we love, then we need to focus first on the relationship with ourselves, then with our children. Only then can we see the relationship we have with our child children's problems. So the idea is, and the whole idea of the book and the whole idea of this education is to shift the focus on what I need to do to fix them to who am I, what do I need to do to fix me, what do I need to work on, and that focus that concentration will automatically lead to a much more enlightened engagement, enlightened relationship with my child and relationship to their problems. I'll have less confusion about what to do. So that really is the shift away and out of codependency and co-participation is a focus on self, right? An acknowledgement of my part of the dance, my dynamic. So let's talk about some ideas and definitions of codependence because it's probably one of the things that I get asked the most about in terms of defining. Codependency has expanded into a definition which describes a dysfunctional pattern of living and problem solving developed during childhood by family rules. That is why so much of our work around the intensives and the work we do is going back into the parent's child of origin, excuse me, family of origin, right? The parent's childhood. Because when we can unpack and unravel that, we're, we're much more capable of helping a parent make decisions, guiding a parent through the decision-making process with their child. So it starts with unraveling and unpacking that. It's a lay term, right? It's not a clinical diagnosis, but it's a lay term, very common one that can be applied to various forms and styles in relating to others where there's a lack of self, a lack of healthy intimacy that can take on the form of overconnected or disconnected. And I'll talk about that again tonight in a few places because that's one of the my passions is to explain how over-identification and over-connection uh, over is just nearly the same thing as somebody who's disconnected. While disconnecting can, can look aloof and distant, non, non, there's a non-feeling to it, sort of, over-connected, while it, it mimics forms of connection, really is a lack of differentiation, a lack of separation between the two, which is required in intimacy. A codependent person is one who has let another person's behavior affect him or her and who is obsessed with controlling, curing, or correcting that person's behavior. For me, this is one of my biggest uh, red flags. When I find myself obsessing about somebody or something and their problems, right? that means that I concentrate, think about it, ruminate about it. That's a sign that I'm in my codependency. So if you find yourself, even with your children, obsessing about it, and, and by the way, I'm going to start off by saying this too, so much of what I talk about tonight are tools for you to ask yourself the question. This is very important, right? It's more important that you use these tools, these concepts, these ideas to ask yourself questions. It's much more important than me diagnosing you with codependency or, or suggesting where you are on this continuum, right? The most important part, the most important idea is that you understand what it is so that you can look for it in yourself and intervene. One of the many definitions of codependency is a set of maladaptive compulsive behaviors learned by family members in order to survive in a family which is experiencing great emotional pain and stress. So you come by it honestly. During times of stress or, or, or difficulty, we, 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 our predisposition is act, activated, right? 
and we're, we're often more times uh, more likely in those situations to demonstrate our codependency. We carry around our own internal sense of how much, of how much and how to connect to others. We recreate these same qualities essentially in our relationships until we develop a new sense of relating to others. So it's about a sensibility. It's about a way of being in the world. It's about and, and the application to your children, to your friends, to your partners, to, to to everybody that you relate to is similar. Obviously, there's different qualities in those relationships. But it's going to show up in, in a lot of different relationships very, very similarly. So when you improve the core issue, the core principle, then you improve all your relationships simultaneously. So what are some symptoms, some things for you to look for and recognize? And again, this is for you to measure, for you to be aware. A, a low sense of self-worth, which also can be connected to a sense of grandiosity, right? If we are overinflated, that is just the other side of the coin of low self-esteem. Right? If we think we're too important or better than other people, right? So uh, grandiosity is just the, the, the bubble before it bursts, right? And we can vacillate back and forth. Um, do we, you know, I think probably one of the most misunderstood or, or, or uh, unintended, uh, unattended to ideas that I see is that so many addicts and alcoholics are codependent. But it's interesting because the culture of addiction and recovery often looks at codependent as the weak person in the family, right? There's this connotation that alcoholics and addicts will have with it, so many don't want to identify with that. But I can't tell you how many times when, I, when dealing with an addict or an alcoholic that really what they're medicating is the dynamics, the feelings, the shame that is really um, intertwined with their codependency. So if any of you are in recovery for addiction, substances, I would invite you to look deeply into, to explore and, and, and investigate codependency and how it might relate to you because I think there's a lot of... What I love about the treatment of codependency, by the way, is it's not a black and white. I mean, if you are off... If, if drugs and alcohol are your addiction and you're abstinent from them, there can at times be this illusion that you're working a, a spiritual program, right? That there is spiritual and psychological healing. Obviously, that's positive. But I think the the root of it all can be this codependency. And the reason I love codependent treatment is because there's no absolute clear marker of sobriety, right? It is more subtle. And so I think it challenges us much more to look deeply. At least that's my experience with it, my observation. Um, we're, we're looking for external validation. We're always referencing ourselves by others. And in fact, that leads to control. I, I say to a lot of parents, you're very, very nice control freaks. Because a lot of people don't see their caretaking and control because it, it, it seems to them come from a place of, I want what's best for the other person, right? But the non-codependent asserts themselves, sets boundaries, makes decisions, and then lets go of the outcome, right? That, that's what it does. Whereas a codependent, on the codependent side of the continuum, we are trying to manage and control others so that we feel okay, right? And we're going to make our decisions and, and, and capitulate on our decisions constantly, because we're so controlled by the other person in our attempt to control them. Um, there's, of course, significant self-awareness deficits from anywhere from being dissociated, not seeing it, to this need to be perfect. They, they talk about in Al-Anon and Codependence Anonymous that, that, that the enemy of progress is perfection, right? That when we need to be perfect, when we pay attention to that, when we have a difficult time accepting our humanness, which is the opposite of that low self-worth, grandiosity coin that I described earlier. That's really the opposite of it. When we can be human and look at ourselves and allow ourselves and be okay with that. And that comes from having had an experience as a child that we were okay. Then that's the healing of codependency. Boundary struggles, right? We either are reactive, right? Completely dependent or completely disconnected, non-empathic. Sometimes people can vacillate between the two because that, that distance is oftentimes a, a protection against the pain and discomfort and, and anxiety that intimacy causes. So I'm going to pull away. I'm going to run away in this relationship. I'm going to divorce. I'm going to become a serial divorcer. And I'm not just talking about partnership and coupleship. <clears throat> I'm talking about that's the way I resolve my intimacy problems in relationships in my life and important relationships. Um... Like I said, this over-dependent, anti-dependent is other sides of the same continuum in terms of the quality of it. Or excuse me, the, 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 yeah, the quality of it. But it essentially is the same issue. 
So we can vacillate from it or we can prefer a, a, a certain style, right? We can have a stylistic preference in terms of our codependency. Like I tend to be, I fall in love quickly. I become overly dependent. I become obsessed. I become anxious around this person and their need for approval. Or I, I don't care. I keep myself aloof. I, I manage my anxiety around my codependent issues by keeping an excessive amount of distance. There's a lack of balance. I think with all addictive behaviors and codependency is a kind of addiction. There's a lack of balance. That, that's another one of my red flags that I pay attention to when I find myself out of balance, when I find myself being irritable or edgy or, or, or bad company, um, eating poorly, not, not taking care of myself, those kinds of things. Um, powerless uh, identity, hopeless. It, there's a blaming to it, right? There's a blaming and a victimhood to it, right? The world is treating me unfairly. I am not responsible for my sadness, my hurt, my pain, my anxiety. Everybody else is responsible for my feelings. My children are causing me to be unhappy. You know that idea, that crazy idea that I think is still a part of our culture that says I can only be as happy as my, own, own, my most unhappy child. Right? They don't need that burden. That doesn't show differentiation. doesn't mean we don't feel for them. I have four children whom I love more than I, can possibly, I could have possibly imagined. But I have to find some separation in that too and find some my own peace and serenity. Um, hypervigilance, right? There's a hypervigilance to it because I, I, I'm always threatened. My serenity, my peace it, it is not in my power and, and can always be taken away from me. So I'm going to be hypervigilant of my surrounding, distrusting of it. It's, it's also evidence of trauma, right? Codependence could be the scar tissue of trauma, either big T or small T, chronic or acute trauma. Oftentimes it's more chronic than not, the trauma that causes this kind of thing. There's a loss of joy, uh, terminal seriousness. My therapist always says that one of the, one of the greatest, most obvious p evidences of, of good mental health is the ability to laugh at oneself and to laugh in general, a sense of humor. Um, Overpersonalizing, of course, would get in the way of that. Taking everything personal, right? That's one of the four agreements in Miguel Ruiz's book, The Four Agreements, is that we take things personal. It's about us. If you get mad at me, it's about me. If, you, if you're frustrated, it's about me. If you're disappointed, it's about me. If you think I'm a jerk, it's about me. If you think I'm great, it's about me. When in reality, all of those things are about you in that equation. And then, of course, there tends to be power struggles, right? We, we stop making decisions from a, a place of truth and honesty and authenticity, and we start making decisions in our effort to try to control somebody else or a specific outcome in somebody else's life. And again, that's a, that's a weird kind of dichotomy, isn't it? Because all of I get this question all the time in this kind of a webinar where people say, then why am I doing this? Then, then what are we doing? So there's a strange kind of leap of faith to start to find and discover your truth, make that your project, and then to express it in your boundaries, in your requests, right, in your life with others. And that we have some kind of trust there. It's just kind of like what you teach your little children. Like if you do the right thing, it'll all turn out okay, even if in the middle of it, it seems horrible. That's the idea of letting go of the outcome and of finding your authenticity and your truth. Other characteristics include, of course, poor boundaries. We, we allow for abuses. I hear people that allow for abuses say this phrase all the time. They can't treat me like that. That's one of the most common things I hear from somebody with poor boundaries. Because they imagine that boundaries are the discussion of boundaries, the threat of boundaries, the, philo the philosophizing of boundaries, right? The request of boundaries. A boundary is a boundary is a boundary. And so that phrase, when people tell me they can't treat me like that, my response usually is to them, I think they can. And what that asks of you, and it asks of you to do one of the most difficult things in life, and for good reason, and that is to set a boundary. And you're afraid if you set a boundary, from the smallest of boundaries with friends that you don't have conflict over, to the more serious and important boundaries with the children, what are you afraid of? Rejection. Because when you were a child, you were programmed to take care of those big people called your parents, and your boundaries weren't okay. And that's happened in your life. And so you don't have the experience that taking care of this is okay. And that people are going to love me if I take care of this. I'm going to be thought to be selfish. Right? I'm going to be thought to be a, a crazy person or a bad person or weird, whatever it is. But it's not okay to take care of this. And I, I think I'm going to diverge just a little bit. 
I think that's that's it. another hint to when we find healthy relationships, people honor our boundaries, even if our boundaries are uncomfortable. But if they come from a place of self-awareness and love and respect and, 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 and a recognition of others and empathizing, but, that, but still positive self-care, when we find people who can honor those, when we find somebody that, that when we say to them, I don't trust you or I'm mad at you, or any number of, of disagreeable things to hear that are said, again, with honesty and with love, when somebody says that to us, or when we say that to somebody and they say, thank you for telling me, how, how did I hurt you? Let me, let me learn about it. Then we know we found somebody special, what I like to call our people, my people. Poor self-care, right? We have guilt around self-care. We get confused around self-care. We don't even know the level of self-care that's appropriate. That is evidence, characteristics of codependency. I've talked about con controlling behavior. Oftentimes, it's very passive. I've said this before, and this is an important one to say tonight. The, the most controlling parenting often is permissive parenting. Right? I talk about that in the Control versus Influence webinar. We, we associate permissive parenting with laissez-faire, with, with, with you know, non-controlling. We associate strict parenting with controlling. The level of strictness, the, the, the number of boundaries, the specific choice around boundaries does not define codependency. What defines codependency is our attempt to control the other. So if I set a boundary with somebody in my life and I let them have their reaction, that's not controlling. If I set a limit or a consequence for my child because that's what I feel comfortable with, that's what the expression of my truth is, then that's not codependent. If I'm doing this to try to tweak their behavior, to fix their brokenness, right, and that's my focus, then that's codependent. There is a facade of selfishness, um, of, excuse me, of selflessness, but it steals care from others. So many people that struggle with codependent would feel horrible Right? They're, they're, they're horrified by the idea of being a burden. However, their neediness leaks and oozes everywhere. Right? They end up taking time, stealing time, stealing energy. I see it with the, the parents that I, I've worked with sometimes, where they're, they're horrified at the idea of being selfish. So nothing is for me, it's all for my child. But that often, almost always comes with the strings attached of, you need to make me feel good about myself. I talked about perfectionism. There's a belief in codependence that their love will cure other people, right? They, they even think it's their job to cure somebody else. I see parents that do this. Love is necessary. Love is absolutely necessary. But, but there's operational things, right? There's skills, there's tools, there's insights, there's boundaries, there's all these other things. It has to be more than this kind of romantic almost. It doesn't sound right to say that about a child, but this, this, it has to be more than this feeling has to be this courageous and this heroic work that we're describing tonight. We get our, need, our needs met indirectly when we are codependent, right? We give with strings attached. We want appreciation. We want gratitude. Um, we want to be loved. We want to be, um, we want to be honored by it. We don't, it's not a gift. It's, it's, an, it's a contract where the, the terms aren't spelled out explicitly and we want something back. And that's another sign that we have that when we, when we start feeling resentful because the other person isn't reciprocating, then we know that there's, then there's some gold there. There's some gold to look at and say, so I'm feeling resentful. What can I do to take care of myself? Because I've just realized I've been asking them to take care of me. And that's my job, not their job. And by their, I mean anybody else's job. It's my job to take care in a marriage, right? That for me, that was the biggest transformation in my marriage with my wife is when both of us realized through a, through a real difficult time that it was my job to take care of me and it was her job to take care of her. And, and when we do that, we also have the capacity to express the, the, the most love possible. Um, so getting our needs met indirectly and being resentful. Um, again, I talked about this, this idea of blaming others for our problems and misery, right? Harriet Lerner, the, the greatest book on boundaries that I've ever read, she says that anger is only an effective tool if it causes us to become more clear about ourselves. So when I get angry at my children, frustrated with my children, my question is, so what do I need to do to take care of myself better? Because they're really crappy at it. <laughs> they're horrible at taking care of me. They're the least reliable people in this house of taking care of me. And it's not their job. So what do I need to do to take care of myself? I need to set a boundary. And then I've got to face the, the terror, the fear of what that could mean, which is, 
my child could abandon me because I have these wounds from childhood that that's what happens to me. Right? I'm not carrying around that internal copy that I'm okay. I, I, I feel too responsible for other people's problems. I make cause, simple cause and effect connections. Right? I talk about influence. I talk about contribution. I talk about a dance. Codependency talks about cause and effect. Codependency goes farther than just empathy or understanding or, or seeing how I hurt you. And codependency says, I'm the cause and the problem of it. If you're upset, that is only evidence of me doing something wrong in this relationship. I remember a mother years ago wrote a great letter that I'd coached her through. A great letter that she needed to write to her child. That was a, a challenging and confronting letter, but it was coming from love. And when I got on the phone with her the following week, she said to me, I said, how are you doing? She said, I, must have, I, wrote, I wrote a terrible letter. Letter. And I said, what makes you believe you wrote a terrible love? And she said, well, look at how upset he is in his letter back to me this week. And then there it was. I said, that's not your measure, right? When our children become our measure for how we're doing, we turn them into an object, into the, the object of really a mirror instead of a human being. We stop paying attention to them and their needs and really just see them as a vehicle to get our needs met, mostly self-esteem and belonging. And, and that's powerful, what I just said. I'm going to say it again slowly. We, when we look at our children and make the determination of how we are doing and how we are and how valuable we are by them and by their actions, we turn them into an object. That object being essentially a mirror, a vehicle for us to get our needs met, primarily our belonging needs and our, and our worth needs. And when you say it that way, we can see the insanity of that. And we can start, if we really are honest with ourselves and really go heroically into ourselves and into our past, we can begin to see the, the threads, the, the, the legacy of that from past generations and from our childhood. Could be from parents, it often is, most of the time is. Could be from grandparents, could be from siblings, could be from our community. We tend to place the needs of, of, of and wants of others first to the exclusion of acknowledging our own, right? It's okay. We, we, if we are full, we will love more, right? If I'm full, if I feel fantastic about myself, really at the core level, what is going to be the expression of that? I just want to give back. How can I be helpful to you? I want to make a difference in the world, a positive difference. And so, so the act of self-care is really, it's, it's parallel to the act of service to others. And you can find love for self through service, but, but often, we have to be clear about this because if we're really doing it for them, it's going to be, it's just going to be going out, right? There, there's not, I'm asking nothing from you back. I need nothing from you back. Even if you take the gift that I give you and throw it in the trash, I won't have resentment or, or hurt. I'll have compassion and curiosity about the pain that you're experience, experiencing. That's, a, that's how you receive a gift. Or even I would have the curiosity that maybe I missed something. Maybe I wasn't as helpful or helpful in the way that you needed me to be. Um, there's anxiety and, uh, and boundary distortions related to intimacy and, and separation, right? I, I talk about when I worked with violent offenders years ago, and I, I did a research study where I interviewed 18 couples, I think it was, and they were all men abusing physically women. And what I saw was that oftentimes the precipitating event that led to the arrest, it wasn't an isolated event, but that the led to the specific arrest, and that's what I was asking about, there often was the woman in these situations begging the husband not to leave and trying to trigger him, right? And he had no management skills and his only expression was, was violent. And so that's how he responded. But more than half of the cases stood in front of the door, jumped on the car, said something incredibly provocative as their partner was walking out the door. And, and I think we have this image that it's always just this quiet, kind of feeble, mousy person. But in the, in the studies that I did, there was this dynamic because being left was more terrifying than even being engaged in an aggressive way for these women. Um, difficulty expressing feelings because we are excessively worried about how others might respond to our feelings. I could talk about this for hours. And, and, and I think about this always in my relationships and when I'm working with people. What would it sound like if the person you were talking to was an adult, a healthy adult? They would be gracious. They would be. They would be. They would listen. They would validate. Right. Even if that expression was about them. But we don't have that experience. We have the experience that if I express my truth, 
and, and somehow it, it, it threatens you or, or, or it hurts your feelings that you're going to reject me. That, that's, the, that's the essence of it. And, and we have that wired into us, right? It's not just some experiences and, and they're in our path. That's our belief. We have an un, undue fear of being hurt and rejected by others. It's funny, I, when I was writing this slide, I thought today, this is the perfect bullet point to illustrate the point that you get to decide if it's undue. I don't. I might have a suspicion, I might be curious, I might ask questions, but you get to decide, right? Only you get to decide. I don't care who else is there. You get to decide if it's undue. That's the work. That's the exploration. That's the heroic journey. Self-esteem dependent upon approval by others. I've said that in a, in a half a dozen ways already tonight. A tendency to ignore our own values and attempt to adhere to the values of others. You can imagine that, right? You can imagine the chameleon-like presentation of the children that come to our program, but also in your own lives. Lacks assertiveness, right? People who let go of the outcome are more honest and set more boundaries, right? They take care of themselves better. And by the way, their bound. This is important. Their boundaries come from the place of this is what I need to do in this situation in this relationship to feel comfortable. I don't need to be right. I don't need to make you wrong. I don't need to tell you what your truth is. What I need to tell you. Son, daughter, spouse, friend, this is what I need. This is what I need. This is what I'm comfortable with. That's where boundaries come from. And instead of setting boundaries, we guilt. We try to guilt other people, talk them into it. We lecture them into it, convince them. We, 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 we have this perpetual hope. We end up in patterns of resentments, expecting and blaming. We do everything except for draw a line in the stand, stand and live by it. The origins of it. Caring for others is how one's worth is measured. Right? That, that's what we have been taught, specifically in the person of our parent. You want a, a longer discussion about this? Read or look at the webinar on uh, the drama of the gifted child. It, it perfectly illustrates this dynamic that all of us have engaged in to, to some degree. Right? Uh, our, we, we grew up in a family where feelings weren't allowed, appreciated. Right? One did, one, one, one did what one was supposed to do regardless of how one felt and our feelings weren't explored. In fact, that doesn't mean that, that the family needs to be boundaryless, but the child needs to experience resonance, right? I'm writing a blog right now on, on, on somewhat on this idea, another small divergence, which is if we could, think about this in terms of your child or your own childhood. If we could know from an early age that we're okay, if we could know that we're okay, that our quirkiness, our weirdness, even our symptoms are, are signs of, of some gifted part of us that's gone astray. But if we could know essentially that we're okay, we could spend the rest of our life developing those gifts and make a huge difference in the world. But when we have to allocate, allocate emotional <clears throat> and psychological resources to defend ourselves, we spend much of our life in that pursuit, defending ourselves that we're okay and we never get to the point where we start to develop our resources, then oftentimes a midlife crisis goes through and we start to really ask ourselves who we are. Sometimes that crisis comes in the form of a, of a child who's sick or addicted, right? So we, we, we have a deeper explore, exploration of ourselves. We sort out all this work. We start understanding the messages from our own childhood and make sense out of it. And we realize that we're okay. We realize that enlightenment is not becoming something else, but it's 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 unbecoming all the things that we thought we should be, right? And being who we always were. And then we realize all this, oh, I've wasted decades in the defense of myself being okay. So what I think about is with my children, it's not easy. This is a daily effort. Is can I connect to their amazingness, even when they are crazy and stupid and, and inconvenient, at least, right? Can I connect to that? Can I set boundaries without shaming? Can I take care of myself without shame? Can I do that? Can I honor them? Can I see them? Even in their craziest behaviors, can I see the wisdom in it? Can I see the enlightenment that, that, that's buried deeply beneath that, that's being expressed by the symptom? Can I connect to who they are through their symptoms? And when I can do those things, I contribute to this, this internal copy that I'm describing, that lets them know that they're okay. That, that wires them in such a way that their, their sensibility, their capacity, their, their, 
the way that they are in the world with others, they'll be okay. And they don't have to allocate resources to prove that to anybody. Um, we learn that when we cover ourselves that we're selfish and wrong. We, the, the word, I, I don't know that I ever use the word selfish except for in, in talks like this. But in, in, in my family, in my personal life, I'm not even sure what the word means because, again, I was thinking about this to, just tonight. I was thinking about some, I was reflecting on something stupid I did. I can't even remember what it was, but it was a long time ago, and I'm like, gosh, that was stupid. And immediately when I did it, I had compassion for myself, and I thought, well, you did that because you were scared. You did that because you thought that was the solution to your pain and your fear. Right? And I, and I want to show that compassion to my clients, to the parents that I work with, and to the students and clients that I, you know, the, the young people that I work with. But, but th th that's, again, another piece of diversion because selfishness is just a symptom, right? And why would I try to shame somebody about a symptom? Do I think that that's the cure? Do I think that that's the healing? Just to follow the analogy, you wouldn't do that with somebody's physical symptoms, right? Somebody who had a knee injury, you wouldn't say you're being weak. You're so fragile, right? You would nurture it and treat it and address it. Why don't we do that with emotional symptoms, with addictions, with somebody who's mean and cruel to people, right? It's hard to be, to be nurturing, to prickly people. And so many of our defenses are prickly. So many of the, all the things that we do, almost all the things that we do, I'll, I'll say it this way, so many of the things that we do to protect ourselves hurt other people and push them away. And the people that, that are the hardest to love are the ones that need it the most, of course. Um, getting our needs met directly was not okay. That was both modeled for it and taught to us. Um, we learned that others are more important than us, right? Probably one of the most disturbing things that I hear parents say is when they utter the phrase, I do everything for my child. Now, I, I believe that children, that the ideal optimal environment for a child is, is a child-centered home and life, Right? But if I utter that phrase, everything I do is for my child, I'm going to have a different... What that tells me about somebody is they need to be good. Right? I need to be good inside. I can't see the bad. And, and that's going to preclude, that's going to prevent my ability to look at myself. And then my child never has a right to be angry with me. Never has a right to be hurt. Never has a right to be frustrated because it's all for their good. And it's all selfless. And that leaves them in a really uh, an untenable position in the universe. Um, rigid and unexamined family rules, right? I've talked about that a lot. Rules can change from child to child. They can change over time. They can change per the circumstance. Not in that way that is enabling. Not in that way that I'm being blown to and fro by the wind, but in that way that I'm going to be thoughtful and intentional about it. When I train our staff, I do staff trainings and therapist trainings, and somebody says, what do you do in this situation? You can't answer that question. There, there's too many variables. Sometimes when somebody says that, I'll respond this way. Sometimes I'll respond that way. Um, the, perpetual, the perpetuation that guilt is a barometer of morality and is used to communicate an obligation to care for another or be responsible for another's feelings. Again, one of the more damaging dogmas out there in, in, in society is that guilt and shame are somehow connected to morality. Right? The, the, the reason that they're so dangerous is because sometimes they are and sometimes they're not. But there is a higher law than guilt and shame and it is called love. Love of self and others. Right? Guilt sometimes is the thing that we feel that causes us to do the wrong thing. Like I always say, parents that I work with when I ask them why they went against their instinct, often the response is, I felt guilty. I felt guilty because he would be upset or hurt or sad. Some family rules that are associated with this, this codependency. It's not okay to talk about problems. We, become, we value successes and happy times, and we don't value difficult times and failures. That's an important shift is to see the value in the struggles and the failures. Feelings are not, be, not to be expressed openly. Keep your feelings to yourself. Right? These are all implicit. And, and they're made worse by the fact that we say you can talk about feelings, but every time you do, I try to talk you out of it. Every time I do, I, you do, I try to tell you to look on the bright side or stop wallowing or stop being a whiner. 
right? And I could go on and on and on. Or I just try to solve the problem. Communication is best if indirect. <laughs> I don't even know if I need to comment on that bullet point. Uh, be strong, good, right, perfect. Mistakes have no value. I talked about that in, in relationship to the first bullet point. Um, make us proud. I don't, I'll just talk for me. I don't use the word pride or proud when it comes to my children. And I don't use, it's, it's, it's opposite, which is disappointed. I don't have the inclination to be proud or disappointed in my children. Right? It's their life. It's their, I'm curious. I, I love them. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a gift that I get to be with them on their journey. And if I can be helpful to it, mostly by getting out of the way getting my, my stuff out of the way. But to be proud of them, that's, that's not their responsibility. Right? And, and I think those are so laden with shame. Do as I say, not as I do. I, I think another way of thinking about that is to, to, the more work that we do in all of these areas, the more conscious we become, the more intentional, the more that our, our communication lines up with our metacommunication. And one of the most insane-making dynamics is when someone says something but means another thing. So if we can come in, if we can work on, and we'll never get to the, the perfect ideal, but if we can work on developing integrity, a, a congruency between what we say and what we feel and think, that will be fantastic. It's not okay to play or be playful. Don't rock the boat. Pain and suffering are to be avoided at all costs. Right? From the journey of the heroic parent, the young woman who believes she is responsible for her mother's feelings will also feel she is responsible when her friends are upset that she doesn't want to go to a party where there's alcohol. The wiring that happens when we tell our children that my frustration and anxiety is your fault and your responsibility and you need to change so that dad and mom are not upset or scared or frustrated or, or whatever is the same wiring that creates the vulnerability to peer pressure. The child then walks around believing that what people feel and think, especially those that care about her, are her responsibility and her issue. So the parenting traits of, of codependency, guilt and shame, but both in the parent and the way we parent. Of course you, you believe that the way to raise a moral child is to guilt and shame them. That's the way that you were taught. You don't know any other way. You don't know that the way to raise a moral child is to teach them how to feel everything. And then they'll recognize feelings in others. Right? They'll see the humanity in others because they're in touch with their own. Rescuing, right? Getting in the way of natural consequences or, or making up for or, or preventing somebody from pain, feeling pain. And by the way, there, there are times when we love to be rescued. Right? But in the end, it is dehumanizing. And I want to feel what I feel. And I don't want to be talked out of it. And I don't want to be told what I should feel. And when I'm sad, I want to be sad. I don't want to be told that I, that I should be happy. Even though I, I have kind of a Buddhist background and, and, and belief system, it's not an appropriate time when somebody's suffering to start to teach them the look on the positive and look, look how this fits into your life, right? The way to respond to them is with the empathy and understanding and to sit with them in their pain. We overvalue the child's needs, especially and particularly at our own expense. I talked about that, right? That's that point where you get to be abused and you don't get to take care of yourself. This is supposed to be another bullet point. There's a typo there. The, we make threats rather than consequences. A, a, a threat in this context is I'm trying to threaten you so you won't do the behavior versus here's a limit and a line that I'm going to draw. And if you step over it, this will be my decision and my consequence. Right? That's not a threat in, in the way that I'm describing. A threat is an emotionally laden threat to try to control you and prevent you from doing it. Whereas a boundary is stating it and letting you know what's happening and then following through with it. This idea that we're getting used and betrayed by it. I mean, this idea that, that our children are betraying us, right? Their children, their jobs are to be half. In my family, we joke about half-brainers, referring to the frontal lobe not being fully developed. They're just half-brainers, right? It's their job to be numbskulls. It's their job to hate us when they're teenagers. That's part of differentiation. And it's our job to be grown up enough to take care of ourselves so that we can be present for those things in the best way possible. Giving with strings attached, I've talked about that. We developed this pattern of, of, of helplessness, of powerlessness, of, of worriedness. And we even think of that as love, 
right? We like like the happiest as, as your most unhappy child. We think that that's an expression or a natural outgrowth of our love. Of course we are going to be affected by our children's pain because we love and are connected to them. That is going to be a part of our, that's a part of loving anybody. And we're going to lose people that we love. But if our, if our core serenity, if our, if our meaning in life <clears throat> is not something that we own, that we take control over, our own happiness is not our responsibility, then we're, we're living in this kind of co-dependent, dependent with them, co-participating in them with, with this insanity. We need to be right. Defending ourselves needing to be right, right? Parents, clients will say to me all the time, they'll tell me something that they feel about somebody in a relationship. And then they'll, they'll, they'll prove to me. They'll tell me stories to, to prove it to me. And after a while, I'll say, you know, you don't have to prove it to me. I, I'm okay with you not liking that person or feeling hurt by them or not trusting them. You don't have to show me that you're justified. And so many times, parents want to justify their decisions and feelings to their children, right? They need their children's implicit approval. They don't say it like that, but that's the action. I need to justify it. Instead of just saying, I might be wrong. I don't know. It's my best guess, but... Maybe this is wrong, but we're going with it because this is my best guess. So we don't need to be right. There's a chapter in my book about being right, the myth of being right. How came based decisions, right? Not, not truth-based decisions, but there's, there's a loss of self in it, right? Now, uh, 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 this, this amorphic kind of cloud-like self because I'm just paying attention to you and controlling you. People that are codependent love to focus on the co-parents' faults, their weaknesses, their limitations, their inability to show up. Um, and... and, and then put themselves in the powerless position. Instead of saying, look, my, 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 I love my wife. This is me talking now. And she has her idiocies and I have mine. And in spite of those, I'm just going to do what I got to do. But when I find myself obsessing about my wife or my ex-wife or my, my co-parent, then I know I'm, I'm in this co codependent co-participation pattern. Specifically about rescuing and enabling, we make excuses, rationalize, justify, use denial or minimize things, right? It's not realistic. We're, we're looking, we have a hard time really grasping reality. We cover up problems, both psychologically and behavioral, behaviorally. We ease other people's pain and we try to talk them out of it. It can look quite abusive, actually. And as we get older, it's more and more ridiculous. You call your parents when you're older and you tell them they're upset and they try to talk you out of it or give you the answer, give you a, a solution. I mean, we, we get to the point where we say, uh, that's not what I mean. It's, I didn't ask for that. right? And, and I get to feel what I feel. We fight battles for the addict or the other. Addict, I, I'm, I'm even sorry that I put that. The other, right? The other one. Um, we circumvent natural consequences. I said that earlier. We become hypervigilant. We become a de detective and obsess. That's my cue. That's my red flag. We blame others, anyone except for the addict, except for the other one acting out, right? And, and, and we don't see even the, the addicts, the, the child's contribution to the problem. When I see it in the students and clients in our program, um, they are often are over overly agreeable. In psychology, we call it that. Um, <clears throat> it's actually introjection. It, it, it's swallowing things whole. When a client thinks that I'm the most amazing therapist and everything that I say is the truth, and they don't digest it or challenge it or ask questions, I'm suspicious. And my and oftentimes my observation, they become hyper cooperative, pleasing, and compliant. Right. They help others first, and they, they love focusing on other people's problems. They're actually great junior therapists, experts, not real therapists, but they, 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 they position themselves as junior therapists and focus on other people's problems and have a hard time looking at their own. They love to be the hero, the white knight, the messiahs to others. They love that feeling of rescuing. They explain this flight to health like I'm cured, right? I'm cured immediately. I've, I've realized the errors in my way, and I'm fixed. Versus the person that says, I realize how screwed up I am. And that's when I know somebody's making progress when they say, I realize that I'm an utter mess. And I'm okay with that. And I'm not saying that in a shameful way. I'm saying that in a humble way where I, I got work to do. They feel they're very vulnerable to peer pressure, of course. One of the things that, that, that students and clients who, who are, are grappling with or, or, or covered in, in codependency is they don't want to write an impact letter to their parents. Right? How can I write an impact letter to my parents saying how they hurt me or how I was frustrated or sad at what they did? Because I was, I'm so bad. But that's okay. The way out of the symptoms is to find a healthy expression of them. And war stories are that assignment where we ask them to write down 
two of the most demonstrative, greatest example stories about how they got high or did something crazy or stole something and how fun it was. We wanted them to get in touch with that part of themselves that liked the drug, that liked the stealing, the fighting, the cutting, whatever it was. And they will refuse to write those. They work too, too much and they go through checking off the boxes, right? They become very task-oriented. And they have a difficult time um, sitting with other people who struggle in the group. And oftentimes get mad at the therapist or the staff when we're facilitating a process where we're helping a child get in touch with their discomfort or their pain. So is everybody codependent? I think of it more of as a continuum. And like I said at the beginning, this is learning to ask yourself the question. So on one end of the continuum, we talk about intimacy, connection, a balanced life, and being assertive. And on the other end of the continuum, we talk about relationships that are marked by power and control. A relationship where people are trying to manage other people's crisis, like their crisis is <clears throat> our crisis. Selflessness to a fault, and passive and passive aggressive. So let's stop thinking about two piles, and let's, stop look, let's start looking at tools and ideas that help us understand when and how we're struggling. So how do you get out of it? Al-Anon. Go to Al-Anon. Go to Codependence Anonymous. Years ago, I tell the story. My therapist stumbled into the cafeteria at University of Utah Hospital. And there was, they were having at night an um, uh, Al-Anon meeting. So all of these wonderful codependent nurturing people invited her to stay. And she sat down. And she said, I walked out of there learning two things. I'm not responsible for my alcoholic husband. She didn't have a, a husband at the time. So she's using this metaphorically. I'm not responsible for my alcoholic husband's behavior and his alcoholism, and don't argue with a drunk. And she said, I found applications to that in all of my life because we're all surrounded by drunks. Our children are drunks, even if they don't drink. They have the reasoning capacity of a drunk. That, that's what that means, somebody that's being unreasonable and irrational. And we get into, I, I've joked about the fact that my wife and I get in debates with our seven-year-old. Okay, I mean, that's insane, right? But it's just as insane to get in a debate with virtually anybody, or a teenager, or, or, or a young adult. So you can't reason with a drunk, and I'm not responsible for their insanity. So go to Al-Anon. It's an addiction to crisis, drama, chaos, imbalance, stress, and disorder. And you can replace alcohol use at Al-Anon with any other self-destructive or crazy behavior. And if you go to Codependence Anonymous, the work is your work. All right? And, and by the way, the, the, the more... I've said this already, but I'm going to restate it. The more you get clear about this issue of codependency and this issue of stronger sense of self and clarity and, and, and intimacy with others, the greater your contribution to others and their health is. So it gets you to where you want to go, but you've got to go to the, this, this, this frightening place, this out-of-control place, this counterintuitive place. Focus on what you can control you. If you can make your focus, make your obsession your mental health, your relapse, your weaknesses, right? That, that there can be no greater contribution to the overall health uh, of you and, and your child that I know of. Challenge your family of origin rules. That doesn't mean that you're not great. I say this all the time. I love my mother more now and appreciate her more now than I did 20 years ago. I am also simultaneously more aware now of how insane she was. When I was 20 years ago, I didn't think she was particularly insane, thought, thought it was average. Now that I've done more work, I see the insanity of some of the messages and I love her and appreciate her even more and have more patience for her and her insanity. So it's not about blame, it's not about being a victim, it's not about saying, it's about a transformation, an awareness, and it comes with love. Challenge your family of origin rules, that they are at the root of much, if not most or all, of the issues that you carry today. Practice detachment and begin to learn that healthy detachment is healthy attachment. Right? It, it, it's, a, it's an ability to, to be whole and to see the other person as whole. Let go of the outcome. I've talked about that in many ways. Learning to replace fear and anxiety with faith. That can be through radical acceptance. That can be through faith in a higher power. That can be through meditation and mindfulness. It can be through a lot of disciplines. Live by the idiot creed. You don't have to be right, you just have to be you. That, that idea that I talk about where if you just take the assumption that you're an idiot, then everybody's going to stop arguing with you. So when you express a feeling or a thought, and somebody says, why do you think that? And say, I don't know, maybe I'm an idiot. Why did you send me to vote? I don't know, maybe it was a mistake. did the best I could. Maybe I'm an idiot. You're going you're gonna to 
stop most arguments with your children at that point because they already convinced you are. Act as if you matter. Take care of yourself and expect others to do the same. Demand others. Require. That's the word. Require others to do the same to enjoy your company. And it does, I don't care who they are. I don't care if they're your parents. This, this obligation we have to be around somebody, even when they're abusive or disrespectful to us, is an insane legacy that we can get rid of. And understand the difference between being a good parent and raising good children. They are two different things that have some relationship, but are not the same thing. And then, of course, uh, addressing the legacy of guilt the way that you're parenting. From the journey of the heroic parent, what I see most in families is over-identification or over-attachment rather than a lack of attachment. This is what somebody said to me in a meeting. I explained that over-identification is the most severe form of attachment. Over-identification doesn't see the child as another, but rather sees the child as an extension or reflection of the parent. In such a relationship the dynamic, there's only one person, the parent. The child is altogether missing in the parent's mind. Detachment is not detaching from the person we care about, but detaching from the agony, the crisis, the drama. Detachment is releasing or detaching from a person or problem with love. Detachment is based on the premise that each person is responsible for himself, that we can't solve problems that aren't ours to solve, and that worrying doesn't help. Detachment involves present, present moment living, living in the here and now. Detachment involves accepting reality, the facts. It requires faith in ourselves, in God, in other people, and in the natural order and destiny of things in this world. Healthy detachment is synonymous. It is the exact same thing as healthy attachment. So if that, if that bristles you, you can replace healthy detachment with healthy attachment. Sometimes detachment even motivates and frees people around, around us to begin to, to solve their own problems. A good rule of thumb is you need to detach most when it seems the least likely or the impossible thing to do. The exit from codependency and co-participation co comes from developing a relationship with yourself. From there, you'll be able to find and connect to your children and others and can establish a healthy relationship with their problems. Our relationship with others' problems is our responsibility. And when we lose our serenity, it is our responsibility to regain it. That's from the journey of the heroic parent. Here's some resources that you can go to. Go to alana.org, familiesanonymous.org, codependence.org. Melanie Beatty's book, Codependence Guide to the 12 Steps, and Codependent No More are, are seminal works on this process. I like Harriet Lerner's book, The Dance of Anger, which has a strange title, but talks great about, talks really well about boundaries. And then Karen Casey's book, Codependence and the Power of Detachment, are also great resources. All right, I'll take a breath and answer any questions that you might have that are related to the topic. All right, I will go through a few announcements and then I'll, I'll, I'll have some more. Oh, I had these two quotes. It is not easy to find happiness in ourselves and it is not possible to find it elsewhere. The greatest challenge in parenting teens is to focus on changing yourself and not your teenager. And you can say changing yourself and not your young adult. That's from the Systematic Training and Effective Parenting Manual. All right, a couple things here. I've been having some requests. Our, our first uh, heroic parenting intensive is filled up, but... I've had four or five, six people ask about another one, so I'm willing to open up another date in January. We are thinking about the 21st to the 24th, I think, if we can fill that one also. I'd be willing to do two that month, so let us know, and you can contact intensives at evoketherapy.com for, for more information. And then I've labeled the rest of the intensives. Finding you is the one for any adult. Heroic parenting is for people that parents. They don't have to be parents from our program, but often are. Uh, and then heroic journey is for, is for the entire family. Also, if you schedule one out far enough for a family, I will change the name of it. In other words, let's say you want to do March 24th through 27th with your family, and you booked it and nobody else had booked it, I will change that to a Heroic Journeys or a private intensive for you. So that's just a little bit of information. On the left side are the parent workshops. We want all families to go to these if they can during their child's enrollment in our program. Um, so we've, we've sketched out dates for next year. Contact Gail to book therapy. Dot com for more information on RSVP. You go to our website for our pursuits programs for young adults and families. We want everybody to go to six of these meetings while their children are with us. Don't wait till the end. <clears throat> Follow us on social media. We are exiting from the second nature social media platform. So please be sure if you haven't yet to follow us on these to keep up on announcements, inspirational quotes, blogs, and so forth. My book is transitioning to um, paperback. 
So uh, uh, Amazon is is out of the hard copies. There's still some at BarnesandNoble.com. In the next week or two, we'll have the the paperbacks, and you can go to you can go there now. All right. Any other questions before I close up, Michael? I feel exhausted. That was a lot of talking for an hour. How can you effectively detach from your child when they are experiencing depression and they live at home? That's the work. I mean, you do work. It doesn't mean you don't have empathy. It doesn't mean you don't feel for them. But you learn. The best way that I can say is focus on you. Focus on taking care of yourself. Focus on doing your work. And when you do that, to the extent that you draw a healthy line around yourself, psychologically speaking, you will then have a relationship with them and their depression that is much healthier. Uh, it, it's hard to explain exactly what that looks like, but that is the process. Right? Then I won't be plagued by, held captive and hostage by, terrorized by your depression. I will see it. I will have empathy and compassion. I will have the courage to feel those things, but I will understand my relationship to you and to it. And I won't be confused about the decisions on a day to day basis that I make around my boundaries and around your depression. So the answer is. You can effectively detach by going to Al-Anon, Code of Menace Anonymous, doing the work that I'm describing, going to a therapist and working on these issues, and finding and getting more clear about this thing called, called you. And remember, um, well, actually, what I'll do, Michael, if there are more questions, Michael says her, her screen is, is malfunctioning. I'll open up so I can see anybody's chat down here. So... Um, if you have a question, you can just uh, enter it in the chat box. If you already have one, Michael's uh, screen is not working right now, and I'll, I'll answer the questions that I read at the bottom of the screen. I'll take two, maybe two more. How do you how do you let go of the outcome when you know your child is participating in illegal things? What does it mean to let go of the outcome? It means that you know your truth, you express it, you set boundaries, you become assertive. And you understand that you can't control them. I'm going to do a little video vlog on, on, on Star Wars. Michael encouraged me to do it because there's so many powerful lessons. It's the difference between the way that Yoda acted and the way that Darth Vader did. You don't become a dictator. You become an assertive, compassionate, loving, boundary-setting person. So letting go of the outcome is, is you, you take a lot of actions. You, you become more assertive. You set more boundaries. But you spiritually and emotionally realize you can't control your child. You can't. And when you let go of that, you're, you're freed up to become more clear about all the things I just described. Can you do a mother-daughter intensive? Um, yeah, I, I, the mother-daughter intensive would be under the category of the heroic journeys. Heroic journeys as families means that I can have two generations. Finding you as any adult of any age. Heroic parenting as any parent in any situation. So it would be the heroic journeys. And like I said, if no, I don't think anybody signed up past the January one. So if nobody signed up for the finding you in February and you sign up for it as a mother-daughter, then I will turn that into a heroic journeys and open it up to other people for family, for you know, parent and children, family uh, relationships. So, all right, one more question. I guess that's it. All right, folks. Next webinar. I'm off next week, so next webinar will be Monday, December twenty eighth. Goals and resolutions we'll be discussing. Um, so look forward to that. Six thirty p.m. Mountain Standard Time, Monday, December twenty eighth. Hope you all have a great week next week while I'm off and I'll talk to you when I get back. Take care. Bye-bye.